In this module one video, we'll be talking about defining and measuring health. Our objectives for this topic are to define health according to the World Health Organization, to describe approaches to measuring health, including self-rated health, life expectancy, quality adjusted life years, and disability adjusted life years. And we'll also explain the purpose of Healthy People 2020. So what is disease? There are a variety of definitions, two of which are here, and these appear in your textbook. Um, so the first is any disruption in the function and structure of the body or an abnormal state in which the body is not capable of responding to or carrying out its normally required functions. <clears throat> Another is almost any departure from perfect health. So those are taking the disease perspective. Um, a very commonly used definition of health, the kind of positive side, is the World Health Organization's definition, which came from a 1948 report and is a state of, of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So highlighting the fact that um, just because someone has a chronic condition doesn't mean they're not healthy, and conversely, someone might be unhealthy even if they don't have a specific disease. So the ways that we measure health, one of the most common and arguably the easiest is to use life expectancy or mortality. Um, so life expectancy, as you probably know, is just the number of years someone is expected to live given that he or she survives to a particular age. So usually we report life expectancy at birth, but you could also report life expectancy at some other time point, so age 65, for example. And life expectancy is commonly used uh, globally as a comparison across populations to look at quality of health care, among other things, um, for populations. So here are a couple examples from the World Health Organization website. Uh, this first one shows life expectancy at birth from 2000 to 2015 among both men and women uh, across different countries in the world. And so you can see that as the, the colors get darker, the life expectancy increases. So much of Europe, Australia, and Canada have the highest life expectancies, while the US, most of South America, and lots of Asia have kind of uh, slightly lower but still pretty high life expectancies at birth and we see most of the lower life expectancies in the African region. And this slide is similar but as life expectancy starting at age 60. So given that someone has survived to age 60, what is uh, their expected life after that point? And here we see that the, the range is kind of more narrow. So even though the, the trends tend to be the same, the same regions tend to have higher life expectancy at age 60. You might notice um, on the legend there on the bottom right that the range only goes from less than 15 to uh, more than 22. So no matter where you live in the world, if you survive to age 60, you actually have a pretty good chance of living at least a decade or two longer after that. So mortality was the first way that we might measure health, and it's a pretty crude measure. It uh, you know, is influenced by lots of different factors, including both personal and social characteristics. Another approach is using self-rated health, so just asking people what they think their health is like. Um, so this is used frequently in population surveys of health. We use it frequently here in the US. And so it might be a question like, would you say that in general your health is excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? And we often dichotomize this so people who say excellent, very good, or good are considered to be in good health and people who say fair or poor are classified as being in poorer health. This question here comes uh, specifically from the 2016 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, but lots of other questions look like that, um, a single item just asking people to evaluate their overall health. So another more complicated approach to measuring health and disability is what we call preference-based measures. And we'll see these again when we start talking about cost-effectiveness analysis. But for now, I just want to give a brief introduction to what they are. Um, and these basically just reflect a value that people attach to a particular health state. So for example, um, we collect information from a population, a sample of the population to understand their preferences for different health states, calculate what proportion um, 
a full health a, a given symptom or experience is associated with. So we might say, you know, imagine that you had, you lost one of your feet. What percentage decrement in your health do you think that would represent? Um, and then we kind of average across the population and come up with a number or weight that we then assign to full health. So on the scale, typically death is represented as zero and full health is represented as a one. So people might say on average that they would experience a 15% decrement in their health if they lost one of their feet. Um, so that would be a weight of 0.85 associated with single foot amputation. So then we can apply that proportion that we calculate to the number of years that people live with that condition. And that is a kind of preference based measure of health or the decrement in health associated with a disease or symptom. So there's different ways that we can calculate the, um, the measure itself. So it might be a standard gamble approach. There's a nice example of this in the textbook. <clears throat> so we create different scenarios and reach kind of a balance point where people are willing to take a trade off. So for example, we might ask people if they would, um, what risk they would take of immediate death to not experience a particular health state. And they might, we might get down to a point where people would take a 13% risk of immediate death and an 87% um, chance of recovery from disease X, from, um, you know, losing, losing a limb. Another approach to calculating these these preference-based measures or utilities is using a time trade-off so asking people um, to think about over time what, what how much time would they will be willing to give up in full health to not experience the condition or you might just do a more straightforward rating scale where people just tell you what kind of level they think is associated with a particular um, disease state or event so those are, those are three different approaches that are commonly used and you might use it within your population. You might use one of these approaches to collect your specific populations, utilities or preference-based ratings of different diseases. But the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation based at the University of Washington in Seattle used the Global Burden of Disease study uh, from a number of years ago to calculate disability weights across all conditions using a, a global sample. Um, so we'll talk in a minute about the fact that there are two broad classes of preference-based measures that we use, quality-adjusted life years and disability-adjusted life years. And one of those main differences is that quality-adjusted life years tend to use one of these standard gamble time trade-off or rating scale approaches, while disability-adjusted life years use this one standardized measure of disability to calculate them. So who provides these ratings? As I said, we might take a sample from the population, but defining our population is an important first step. <clears throat> so we might only want our sample to include people who have the disease that we're interested in rating. Um, conversely, other, you know, some people argue that we shouldn't ask people themselves, we should ask people without the condition. And so that could either be just the, the general population, anyone who doesn't have the condition, or we might focus on people who are close to others who have the condition we're interested in. So family members, friends, caregivers, uh, those types of folks. There's also a way to use all of the above, and you might weight your results so that the responses from people who do have the disease represent the same proportion of people in your population who have the disease of interest. So as I said, quality adjusted life years and disability adjusted life years are the two main categories of measures that use these, these weights or these preference-based approaches. So quality adjusted life years quantifies health. And so it goes on a zero to one scale, as I mentioned before, where zero represents death and one represents full health. And so it, it incorporates those preference-based weights, which we call utilities, to then adjust um, years of life given these, these utility ratings. So we can use quality adjusted life years to compare the impact of conditions. Um, we can compare across conditions, across countries, across populations, and we can also use them to evaluate the impact of an intervention. Disability adjusted life years are very similar to quality adjusted life years, but the difference is the scale is basically reversed. So the focus is disability. So zero, instead of representing death, 
represents no disability and one represents full disability. So basically with a quali, you want higher numbers um, that indicates more years lived in full health, while with, dis with dollies or disability adjusted life years, you want lower numbers. So you want numbers closer to zero because that represents better health. So these also, again, incorporate a preference-based measure, but as I mentioned before, it uses that one single measure of disability that was derived by the IHME group from the Global um, Burden of Disease Study. So that is one potential advantage. It's a, it's a constant across studies. It's an easy, easy to compare measure, and it's also what the World Health Organization uses. So it's a nice one to benchmark. Um, and the World Health Organization provides a definition of what dollies are, which I've included here along with the link to their site. So as they say, it can be thought of as one year lost of healthy life. And so if you sum dollies across the population, you can measure the gap between current health status and ideal health status, where the entire population would live to an advanced age free of disease and disability. So this is a pretty complex topic and idea, and I've just glossed over it. Um, there's more information in your textbook, and I also recommend this video uh, that's linked here on the bottom. There's actually a whole series that the, um, Dr. Lee does out of UCSF, and this particular link takes you to the one that talks about dollies and qualities and compares them. Um, and as I said, we'll be coming back to these topics when we talk about cost effectiveness in a future module. So that's how we measure health. Um, and we also, to, we, as I said, we, you can use dollies and qualities and other measures of health to compare cross populations, across conditions, across time. And that is one foundation of public health planning in the US. So typically we do large scale planning efforts. So at the national or regional levels and healthy people, which you probably have heard of, is our primary public health planning tool at a national level. So healthypeople.gov is the website. And there, we're currently under Healthy People 2020 still. They've just started doing meetings to plan for Healthy People 2030. And it's run through the US Department of Health and Human Services and the National Center for Health Statistics, which is part of the CDC. And so each decade we have a new plan and set of objectives. So for 2020, the vision is a society in which people can live long, healthy lives. And there are four overarching goals that are listed here. And these are the various topics. So you can see lots of topics ranging from particular diseases like diabetes to population groups like older adults and people who identify as LGBTQ. Um, there's also maternal child health, health-related quality of life and well-being is a new topic in 2020. So within each of these topics, there are a set of measurable objectives with targets that we um, are trying to reach by 2020. There are also foundation measures, and two of them relate to kind of our topic today. Uh, the first is general health status, and that's actually measured a variety of ways, life expectancy, YPLL is years of potential life loss, so it's just life expectancy minus the age of death. Um, activity limitations, chronic disease prevalence, and physically and mentally unhealthy days. And there's also health-related quality of life and well-being that are uh, part of the 2020 foundation measures. And those are really measured primarily through the PROMISE system measures, so those are patient, rep patient reported outcomes. That was a new uh, kind of agency within the federal government that was established as part of the Affordable Care Act. And participation is another um, measure that's used in Healthy People 2020. In addition to those two measures that relate to our topics today, determinants of health and disparities of the other two foundation measures for Healthy People 2020. So in summary, there are multiple definitions of health and disease that we use and multiple ways that we can measure these concepts. So it really depends on context and what you're interested in, in terms of what measures you might use. And life expectancy or a modified measure of life expectancy, qualities or dollies, is commonly used to compare across populations. So for this week's module discussion board, I'd like you all to think about how you would measure health. I'd like you to think about a particular health setting 
um, and population that you're interested in, and then think about what would be the best way or ways to measure the health of that population. And also think about how often you would do it, what, what method you would use, would you do online surveys, how would you get people uh, to participate. So that'll be our discussion, that'll kick us off, and then we'll um, have responses to each other. So that's it for this module.